I'm going to be teaching on um, Rosh Hashanah because just in a few days, uh, in, in the traditional Jewish calendar, it's starting tomorrow night. Uh, on the biblical calendar, it's starting Monday night. So I want you to turn to Leviticus 23 and also hold a spot in Nehemiah 8 and also Matthew 24. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before You. Father, we bless You. We praise You. You are great and mighty. You are holy, holy, holy. You are kadosh. Father, we, we love to be in Your presence. Father, we love to hear Your voice. We love to have You teach us from Your Word. We ask, as always, Lord, for Your wisdom. We ask that your spirit would interpret for us. Father, we ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, open our hearts that we can receive from the seed of your word and produce good fruit for you. Father, we pray, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam, Asher Kedishara B'Mitzvotah V'Tivanu V'Asok B'Divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies sanctifies us by your commandments and commands us to immerse ourselves in the words of Torah. Amen. Who here knows what Rosh Hashanah is? Raise your hand. Who does not understand what Rosh Hashanah is? Raise your hand. Okay, a few. Let's start in Leviticus 23. Verse 23. Adonai said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, in the seventh month, the first of the month, that's just coming up. We're, in fact, I want to say, hallelujah, we're coming to the end of Elul. Right? <laughs> Praise God. Look at all the looks on people's faces. I'm like, yes. In the seventh month, the first day of the month, is to be for you a day of complete rest for remembering. Did you catch that? It's a day of rest to remember. A holy convocation announced with blasts on the shofar. Do not do any kind of ordinary work and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. And then it goes on to list the rest of the feasts. So Yom Teruah day of the trumpet blast, the alarm blast, the call to war. Think about that. Rosh Hashanah. We call it Rosh Hashanah because the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar becomes the head of the civil new year. Okay, the head of the religious year was at the month of Passover, where, where we have Passover. The first month. But the civil new year is in the seventh month, the first day of the seventh month. Rosh means head, Hashanah means year. So it's the head of the year. And here in Leviticus, it's also called, in Jewish writings, Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembering. And so the question we should be having, especially in the context of the Torah here, in Leviticus, what are we supposed to be remembering? You got some ideas? Anyone? Okay, we say that, but what's the context here in Leviticus? Leviticus, God is establishing something with the people. He's giving directions, teachings, commandments. And he's talking about, and he starts, if you go all the way back to verse 1 in chapter 23, he starts, he starts with the Shabbat. Okay? Six days you'll do labor. On the seventh is a day of rest. Right? Creation. Keep that in your pocket. I'll talk about that. And then he goes on to talk about Passover. Right? And unleavened bread. And first fruits. Okay? And he details what days of the month that happens. 
how long it lasts, whether it's a Shabbat or not, what you're supposed to do or not do on it, right? He starts talking about it. But the, what is the reason for keeping the feast besides God says so? What is the reason behind it? Why do we keep Passover? It's a rehearsal. I like that word. I've used that word a lot before. It's a rehearsal. A remembrance. Okay? Remember in Hebrew thought, a remembrance can be after an event takes place and we recall it like a memorial. But we can also have a remembrance so we are rehearsing for what's coming. So we don't miss it. Okay? In Hebrew, a remembrance can be before or after. And many times both. We, re, or we, we are rehearsing before so we don't miss it when it comes. And we are recalling it afterwards, remembering. Why do we need to remember? Why, once the Passover happened, why is God wanting His people to practice it every year? So we don't forget what? We don't forget what He's done for us and how he actually feels about us. Who here in life, let's be honest, okay? I'm not asking for your perfect thoughts and perfect feelings at the moment as you're sitting in congregation. As you go through life throughout the week, throughout the years, and you have challenges, and people uh, betray you, and children turn on you, and spouses, and all these things that just evoke all the dark things in you, is it easy or difficult to remember that God loves you? Many times it's difficult, right? Why is this bad thing happening to me, God? You don't love me anymore? That's, that's like the automatic place humanity goes, right? Would, are we in agreement? By and large, there's always an exception. But generally speaking, it's a challenge in life to remember these things. Life can be a distraction. All the demands, all the, the, the things we put upon ourselves, how we perceive stuff. You could have reality right in front of you telling you one thing, but your own emotions and your own experiences can cloud reality, right? That's how life is sometimes. So God has, on one level, has put these practices before us and asks us and commands us to keep them so we don't forget. So when our perceptions are clouded, we go back to this and go, no, 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 no. I remember. We've done this every year. My forefathers did it. My fathers, their fathers, 30, 3,500 years ago. This is what happened. We don't forget. To use a prime example today would be the Holocaust, the Yom HaShoah. Who here knows that it's being forgotten? You have whole, a whole generation who are going, what's the Holocaust? Literally. And that was only how long ago? We're talking 3,500 years ago. And But something so big and so atrocious that killed so many millions, not just Jews, is actually being forgotten? Shame on us. Shame on us as a people that we allow that to happen. That's what God is doing here with the feasts. He's saying, hey, I, the creator of the universe, actually showed up in your midst and actually intervened in miraculous ways in your life to change history and to show you how much I love you. Don't you dare forget you understand? So it's easier for us to parse things out when we want to keep the commandments. And it's not wrong to, to question and ask, and God, how are we to practice? Should we make a sukkah, even though we're not a neighbor in the land? Okay. Should we do it, you know, what, what, they say it's on Sunday night, we say it's on Monday night. Now sometimes those things are very important. But I'll tell you what the greater principle is. Are you doing it at all? Are you remembering? Okay? I know there are Jewish traditions that we go, it doesn't say that in Scripture, I don't have to do that. And you don't. But you don't, here's the default of humanity. I've seen it 
in my short 53 years, okay? I've seen it in my own life, and I've seen it with many, many others, hundreds if not thousands of others. I've seen it time and time again. If you don't set aside a day that God commands to be special, and if you don't create special traditions or customs around it, you know what it becomes? Just another day of the week. Yeah, yeah, I know it's Rosh Hashanah, but you do nothing. You get up the same way you always do. You have your same cup of coffee. You have your same type of breakfast. You don't make it special. Traditions are not bad. Rituals are not innately evil. They're a tool to help us make something special. The problem that happens is when you elevate the tradition above the actual reason for doing it. That's when it becomes a problem. That's when things become legalism. And God doesn't support that. He wants the spirit behind it. That's the most important thing. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I say this time and time again. Sanctify it. We're not supposed to throw our emotions out and pretend we're emotionless. That is unhealthy, right? What should we do? Sanctify it. How do you do that? Get rid of the bad stuff, hang on to the good, and go to God with it and ask Him how you operate in it. It's the same principle. So I prefer to take this approach. God says make a sukkah. Okay? A temporary dwelling. There are some traditions behind it. Can I accomplish that? I know I'm not in the land, so I don't technically have to do it, but it's a rehearsal. I don't want to go, well, God, I didn't do it because I wasn't in Israel. I'd rather go, God, I kept it even though I'm not in Israel. You think God's going to go, oh, I didn't recognize that. I don't care about your heart and your effort. Do you think that's what God does? Absolutely not. God goes, I'm happy. I'm going to bless you. When we bless God, do you think God ignores it? Nope, I have no interest. Not when your heart's right. It's a heart that's genuine and true and repentant and recognizing Him as our King and we serve Him. He blesses that. I want all the blessing I could get. I don't care if it, there's some effort involved. Right? Hands going up over here. And it looked excited, so I'm going to wait for it to get there. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to say I made a sukkah last year, and it was um, a tent I borrowed from my mom. It was bigger, and I could um, I borrowed her tent because I could put like an actual table, and I put rugs. But Perfect. it was funny because I was in there, and I was all bundled up, and I was like... I could see my breath. It was so cold. I know. Huh? <laughs> I know so, around here, it's <laughs> Israel. It's great here. So, <laughs> I didn't sleep in it, um, I mean, but okay. I but I still got to go in there. And and then wouldn't you know? You know, we were all in Israel just a month later at the end of Sukkot. And how was that? Amazing. Amazing. So why am I saying this stuff? I'm I'm trying to begin here with a certain perspective and mentality. So what is this a time of remembering? If it's the context in the Torah, they just had, remember, they're an agrarian society, right? So what do they have to do? Okay, there's harvest going on, there's planting, there's harvesting, there's all this stuff, and then we have the summertime where it's a nice pause, right? Ah, no more work. And now Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the wet harvest. It's another harvest time. That's laborious. Okay? Who here has done a harvest? Is it laborious? It's high demand, isn't it? Okay? And at that time, God wants us to show up to have a, an appointment with Him. Hey, I want to meet with you. And don't forget, this is a time to remember. To remember what? That I'm your God. You've had this pause that I love you. I love you like a groom loves his wife. I want you to remember that. I want to remember all that I did to you to prove my love to you. That's what's going on. But it's also a remembrance for this. 
and I'm going to probably talk about this in more detail on Rosh Hashanah briefly, but there's a reason why we blow horns, the shofar, the ram's horn, okay? That's part of the remembrance too. We blow the ram's horn to remember. When was the ram's horn significant in Scripture? You're both right. Two specific times in Scripture specifically. Jericho was another one. See, you see the trend coming now? Whenever a shofar is used with God involved, it's always miraculous, isn't it? It's where God reveals himself. So what are we to remember? He's saying, this is the day to remember the ram's horn. What happened? Abraham, God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And by the way, he asked, it was not a command. I've talked about this before. But the Hebrew verbiage that's used in the Torah is very specific. It is, God is not saying, the son, the son that you love, I demand that you give him to me. He's not saying that. The way it's worded in Hebrew is very gentle. He says, the, the one that you love, the son that you love, will you please give him to me? It's a gentle request. Who here has a son that is loved by you dearly? And can you imagine God asking you, appearing to you and gently asking, will you please give me your son? Can you imagine that? And Abraham does it. And God, it's all that we know it's the test, the Akedah, right? We know it's the test. We know Abraham was not a young boy. He was in his 30s. Okay? That's what, I'm sorry, Isaac. We know Isaac was in his 30s. That's why he said, Dad, you better tie me up. Okay? I might resist. And what does God do? A ram's horns are caught in a thicket. He goes to sacrifice Isaac. God, an angel appears and says, stops him. And God supplied an alternate sacrifice. We're to remember part of Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, just to remember that. That God provides an alternate sacrifice. The demand is from us. From everything we have and we love dearly. But God, seeing that when we give that, goes, I, I trust you. I see you're going to do it. But more importantly, do you think God didn't know that Abraham loved him that much? It was for Abraham. Abraham needed to see it. That would be transformative. It was probably also for Isaac too. But the point was, God said, no, I love you so much, I'll supply the sacrifice for you. And it will represent your greatest love. Okay. We're to remember that. We're to remember when God appeared on Mount Sinai to what? The sound of the shofar. It said it was thunder and God spoke and the shofar sounded. It was a shofar blast. We're to remember that. What happened then? God came down on earth and manifested God the Father with the Spirit and the Son and manifested in such a powerful way and took to himself a people to be his bride. We're to remember that. But even more so if you're a believer and you understand that Yeshua the Messiah came 2,000 years ago, that he is our alternate sacrifice, right? The lamb that was slain for Passover, but also just like Abraham, for us, okay? We're to remember that too. So that's what Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of it, is about. Hands going up, Jim. Hello. <laughs> As you were talking, I couldn't help but think to carry it a little bit farther than that even, that how God always shows up for us. Always. No matter what the problem, no matter what the situation, how dark it looks, 
He always shows up just like he did before. And how do we know that? Because he says so. What did he say? I'll never leave you and never will I forsake you. On top of that, we're to remember, I believe, all the other times in Scripture during Rosh Hashanah. Yes. Uh, piggybacking on that, First Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So when he comes back... It's to a trumpet blast. Right. A memorial before and after, right? So that's actually what I'm getting to and I'm going to end with, but you got the right idea. No, you're fine. You got the right idea. You're seeing it. But I think we're also sp supposed to remember the rest of the places in Scripture where there's a Rosh Hashanah. One more. In the Psalms, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And how gracious he is that we don't have to remember them all. Um, but he says, don't forget uh, all of them. And in Psalm 23, it says, lead me in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And that word path is not Derek. It is a word that has a cyclical connotation, which ties into the, the feast and annual the Torah teachings That's and the right. feast. That's right. Very good. Very good. So a Jewish or rabbinic tradition understanding is that Rosh Hashanah, and there's biblical basis for this, Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. And what happens on Rosh Hashanah, we have 10 days, according to the calendar, which are called the, the days of awe, days of repentance. God gives you 10 more days to get things right because on Yom Kippur, 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, what he started, his judgment began on Rosh Hashanah, it's sealed on Yom Kippur. The understanding is on Rosh Hashanah, the books are open. And there's scriptural basis for this. I'll get to that. There's scripture that talks about the great white throne judgment in the book of Revelation. And God the Father shows up. And it says books are open. The book of life is open and other books are open. And judgment is coming. Okay? And on Yom Kippur, which, what are we supposed to wear? All white. Great white throne judgment. You think there's a correlation perhaps in understanding? I think that's an okay tradition. I think it's a righteous tradition. Yeshua even talked about, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding. Remember the parable? And everybody in the wedding is given white robes to wear. But a man got in and he didn't have a white robe. And so the groom said, who's this man? That, how come he doesn't have his robe? They came in and said, how'd you get in here? He doesn't have a white robe. What did Yeshua say? That man got to stay? No. He said, you don't belong here. Out. And they escorted him out. And out, it said, was where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth and darkness. I'm like, whoa, I'll wear white. Okay? But in all seriousness, really some traditions are a very small thing. They really are. It's for us to remember. It's for us to rehearse. On my wedding day, now our tradition in America, okay, the groom doesn't always traditionally wear white, but the bride does, right? Well, in God's kingdom, we're not the groom. We're the bride. We should be wearing white. We will be wearing white, it says in Revelation 19. The bride does wear white. So I'm okay rehearsing once a year by wearing white. What's the problem? And so what am I saying? At Rosh Hashanah, it's considered the day of judgment. It's also, we're supposed to remember, and the rabbis talk about this, that in the Hebrew in Genesis that it's hidden, they say, and it's very interesting. Look it up because it's, it's, it would take me a long time to explain it. But they, they say in the Hebrew is embedded the words first of Tishri, which is the seventh month. And then that's when creation began. And if that's true, then there's another remembrance. What are we supposed to remember? 
that this is when God created everything. And God didn't create it because he was unhappy. He loved it. Read Genesis again. What did it say? And he said, it is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. Gets to the sixth day. It's, wait, man is alone. That's not good. Now he gives him woman. Now it's good. Now he says, it's very good. Right? That's what it says. Okay? We're to remember all of that. That God is our creator. And he took great joy. I challenge you. The images I have and the perspective I have of Scripture and of who God is, I think God took great joy in creation. I think He was probably at His most excited and happiest. Think about it. Who's an artist here? Or somebody who creates anything. Don't you put yourself into it? Don't you put a part of your own soul into it? You, it's you. Right? And it's, it's an extension of you. That's what the Father did with us. He created us all. He took great joy in it. I think we're to remember that. Please turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. I think this is another thing we're supposed to remember. Why? Because it takes place on Rosh Hashanah. Verse 1, Nehemiah 8, verse 1. All the people gathered with one accord in the open space in front of the water gate and asked Ezra, the Torah teacher, to bring the scroll of the Torah of Moshe, which Adonai had commanded Israel. Ezra the Kohen brought the Torah before the assembly, which consisted of men, women, and all children old enough to understand. It was the first day of the seventh month. Rosh Hashanah. Facing the open space in front of the water gate, he read from it to the men and the women and the children who could understand from early morning until noon. Could you imagine if I sat here early morning and just started reading Scripture and we sat here and listened all the way till noon? Right? That's dedication. That's passion. That means you really want to hear it. Right? Right? And all the people listened attentively to the scroll of the Torah. Ezra, the Torah teacher, stood on a wood platform, which they had made for the purpose. Beside him on his right stood Matadyahu, and then it gives a list of all the people involved. But I want to go down to, and, and please read all this when you get the chance, but where I want to go is right down here, verse 9. Nehemiah, the Tirshata, Ezra, the Kohen, and Torah teacher, and the Levi'im, the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, today is consecrated to Adonai your God. Don't be mournful, don't weep. Because if you go up to people, well, they were weeping when they heard the Torah scroll. They were mournful. They felt bad for their sins because they were hearing what God says and how He cared about them, and they were mourning. They were like, we are terrible. They were in repentance. But right here, their leaders say this. Today is consecrated to Adonai your God. Don't be mournful. Don't weep. For all the people had been weeping when they heard the words of the Torah. Then he said to them, Go eat rich food, drink sweet drinks, and send portions to those who can't provide for themselves. For today is consecrated to our Lord. Why do they say that? Because it's a feast day. It's a holy day. It's Rosh Hashanah. They're saying, We don't mourn on Sabbath. We enjoy We've had mourning. Now it's time for new beginnings. And then it says right here, the famous verse. Don't be sad because the joy of Adonai, the joy of the Lord, the joy of Yah is your strength. But guess what? I've taught this before. The word strength there in English, it doesn't say that in the Hebrew. The word in Hebrew means fortress or stronghold the joy of the lord is your fortress it's the place where you're safe and protected that's what it means in hebrew so sure a fortress is strong i just don't understand why in the english 
they use the word strength when the word means fortress or stronghold. It's the image of a strong tower or a castle. Not of you like this. Yeah, I'm beefy. Something like that. It's God is your fortress, the joy of the Lord. And how is the joy of the Lord in context here? It's not something you have to fabricate. It's like, stop. There's a time and place and a time and season. He's saying, go, eat rich food, drink sweet drinks. In other words, go party with God. As an assembly, it's a sacred assembly. Go enjoy and have fun. And that joy will be a protection for you. It will keep you safe. It's a holy joy. Do you understand? So, to put it in a context right now, we've gone through a little. We're going. It's, the little is ending. Sometimes a little is a time of trial and testing, right? We know this. It can be challenging, heavy. Rosh Hashanah, no more heaviness, no more mourning. It's time to be joyful and to enjoy new beginnings. It's a new start, Rosh Hashanah. Remember creation. Remember how much God loves you. Remember what He's done for you. Remember all the miracles. And that's just from Scripture. I'm sure all of us have testimonies of miracles that He's done in ways He's intervened in our life. Yes? I think we're supposed to remember all of that too. I think it's personal as well as as a whole people. I think it's both. So we should approach Rosh Hashanah with that perspective and mentality. I'm excited. Like, oh, thank you, God. No more Elul. Good. No more trial right now. It's new beginnings. That's come to an end. It's judgment day. But judgment day for the righteous is an exciting thing. For the wicked is not. And and what God's provided is just in case Elul was not long enough for you, I'm giving you 10 more days to work it out. But I'm still going to approach Rosh Hashanah with joy because he says so. If God, if his joy is a fortress to us and he wants us to be joyful, do you think God is upset? Do you think he's angry? Not on Rosh Hashanah. I think God wants us to party because I think God showed up happy and the people are like, oh, it's terrible. And God's like, what are you doing? Let's party. Let's hang out. Let's be together. Be joyful. That's what he's saying. I think that's what the remembrance is for. So we recall the goodness and we get happy again. It's interesting to note that God gives us 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to to Yom Kippur. Does anybody remember what 10 signifies in Hebrew? Righteous government. So it's it's very symbolic. But I think it's also reality. I think God's saying, I'm giving you a time to establish righteous government in yourself. You understand in your life, in your area of influence, establish 10, I'm giving you 10, righteous government, and that's what it will establish. And then on Yom Kippur, I'll cover the rest. Right? I'm going to clothe you with white. I just want to go through this real quick. Just to give you an idea of some of the traditions and what it's about. And I can't take credit for all this. Some of the, the what I expound on, can't, this was actually on, uh, um, what is it, belief.net or whatever. It's a, there's you know, Jewish segments of this website. And it was perfect. I saw this and I go, huh, I wonder what they're going to say. And I was going through it. I go, oh, that's beautiful. I go, that's, that's perfect the way they did it. I'm like, I'm going to write this down. And I'm going to expound on it. One, Rosh Hashanah, some of the traditional ways that, that Jewish people celebrate, and we celebrate. Lashanah Tovah. Umetuka. We always start Rosh Hashanah with what? Lashanah Tova. Happy New Year, right? But we're saying, have a happy New Year and may you be inscribed in the book of life. It's like saying shalom. Peace. Peace be with you, right? 
It's a declaration. It's not just a, hey, Happy New Year. It's not a casual thing. It's a declaration. Okay? We set the tone right there with that. It's joyful. Okay, next slide, please. And then two, eating apples and honey. Why do we do that? Why do we eat apples and honey on Rosh Hashanah? For those who remember the practice, why do we do it? What does that have to do with Rosh Hashanah? Because you, the idea is that you can have a sweet new year. They both symbolize the sweetness of the new year. It's the wet harvest. This is the perfect time uh, to go out to apple orchards, pick apples and get the family and friends involved. Kids have fun being outside, collecting enough apples to make apple honey chicken or apple honey turnovers. Oh, that sounds good right now. But see, think about this. You're like, why do I have to do that silly tradition? So remember, I've told you this for years. You know, it's interesting. Amongst Christian circles, I always, and from believers in Christians, I always get this phrase, how do you teach your kids? How do you teach your family to follow the ways of God? And I go, what do you mean? It's easy. And they go, no, no, we, we don't know what to do. I'm like, oh. I go, well, we just practice it. We just do it. And we have traditions that we've established to help us do that as well. But we set aside the days and we actually keep the day, right? So when God says don't work, we don't work. We make it special. We light two candles on you know, Friday evening. We say blessings and prayers and songs and we have a festive meal and we hang out. You know, it, it becomes the kids, if they embrace it when they're older, but as they're growing, there are very tactile ways to help them remember. It brings joy. Oh, I remember hanging out at the table. That's fun. I like that, right? It's the same thing. Why eating apples and honey? Is there anywhere in Scripture that says, and this is what I get all the time, there's nowhere, Scripture does not command me to do that. I don't have to do that. And I go, you don't? You're right. And I go, but nowhere in Scripture does it say you can't do that either. See the difference? Why is it always restrictive? Scripture is not always restrictive. There are some negative command. Don't steal. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Right? There's some things like that. But a lot of the rest is left open. So guess what that means? God's saying, go crazy with it. Have fun with it. Do whatever you want with it. But do something. Don't be always in this place of restrictive. Well, Scripture doesn't say I have to do that, so I'm not going to. Rather, take an approach of, hey, that's a great tradition. Nothing unbiblical about that. So, why not? If you can come up with a better one for your family, go for it. Scripture doesn't say, as long as Scripture doesn't say, hey, don't do it that way. As long as it does it, sky's the limit. Right? Take that approach. God is very, hey, I want to see, you get creative. Show me how much you love me. How are you going to make the day special? Put your own personal touch on it if you have to, but do it, okay? Don't just, oh, I have good feelings about it. I remember it in my head, but every, the day is just the same as normal. Nope. Now that, in my opinion, that's a sin, okay? That's a problem. I think you're not honoring God at all that way, just because it's in your heart. So one of the things we do is eat apples and honey, why? To remember the sweetness of a new year. May you have a good new year. May it be sweet and good, taste good, feel good, all those things. It's a tactile way to teach your children and your family and yourself to remember. You know, most of us grew up with certain traditions like birthdays, Christmas, right? Now, I'll challenge that all day long. I'm not going to do a teaching on it. But nowhere in Scripture is there Christmas, okay? Yeshua's birthday was at Sukkot, not in December. And I'm not going to go into that, but my point is, who here has fond memories growing up with Christmas? Be honest. Why? Because it was made a special day with special things you do that are different from any other day. And you don't do it every other day. You only do it on one specific day. And I'm trying to get into the principle of the thing. You remember, oh, we get gifts, and we drink certain things, and sing certain songs, and we have beautiful things in the house, right? And we do lights, and we do this. And when you grow up, do you, do you have fond memories? Do you feel good? Does it produce a joy in you? Yes. 
that's what God's asking us to do here. And this is a day that he created, not that we made up, but he said is a special day. Why not? Make special things. Do special things. Teach your children, because when they grow up, if you raise them in stuff like this, they're going to remember with joy. Okay? Next slide, please. Forgiveness. Rosh Hashanah is about forgiveness. Learning to forgive. Seeking forgiveness for our sins, because Rosh Hashanah has been trials. We've been faced with things and weaknesses in ourselves. Well, right? Elul has, and Rosh Hashanah has. Now we're coming to it. It's, a, it's still the time of introspection, 10 days till Yom Kippur. So if there's still things you're dealing with, we seek forgiveness for our sins. That's an important part of Rosh Hashanah. We must be aware of our mistakes and repent. We're expected to make peace with the individual who hurt us, or if we sinned against them, we need to apologize. It's a time of reconciliation. It's new beginnings. Don't start the year coming in with baggage. Take care of it. Okay? That's why God's giving you 10 extra days. Hey, if you forgot something, there's still something there hanging on. Don't just ignore it. Deal with it. God is near at this time helping us. Every year's um, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I already talked about that, so that's good. Next slide. Listening to the shofar. We know we do that on the service of Rosh Hashanah, right? The hallowed ram's horn is blown on Rosh Hashanah and is used to remind the people to study Torah. It's a cry to God that we're committed to Him and recognize Him as King to correct our ways and return to the right path. The shofar is used to help God's people to reflect and mourn the destruction of the Holy Temple. Okay, that is a big deal. Whether in our culture or not, we realize it. It is. It is also a way for God's people to remember and be thankful for the sacrifice made for us. And I've already talked about that in detail. And remember what the blasts are? The tekiah, the single blast, short single blast, which is the call to assemble and the call to worship. Okay. The shevarim, which is the three mournful blasts which is the call to repentance. The teruah, which this day specifically is called. It's the nine staccato blasts. It's the alarm blast or the call to war, time to wake up. Okay? And then the tekiah gadola, the last, the fourth blast. It's the great blast. It's the call of the Messiah. It's the signal to bring home the Messiah. Okay? She was talking about that. Next slide. A family meal. Right? What feast, except Yom Kippur, what Jewish feast is not without some kind of festive meal? Or oneg, right? The celebration would not be complete without the, the festive meal called the, the, sedu, uh, the Sadat uh, Yom Tov. The meal is shared with family and friends where the challah is baked round, not long. Okay? It's round. Signifying the cycle of life, the cycle, the, the return to a new year, okay? Traditionally, the main course, as you see up there, is a fish head. Usually, that's the main course. It's in Jewish tradition. In Deuteronomy 28, 13, they base it on this. It reads, you will be the head, not the tail. But think about it. We go, what tradition says that? It's all based, most of the traditions have some kind of basis in Scripture, whether we recognize it or not or understand it. Okay. It's a fun thing. And then last slide, please. A time to reflect. Tashlik. Okay. We do Tashlik. It's a tradition. I have to say this real quick on a side note. Look real close at that picture that I picked. It's bigger, actually, but I, I trimmed it down. When I opened up this picture looking for Jews doing Tashlik on Rosh Hashanah, this popped up, and I don't know if you can see it well there, but see the, the gentleman with the tallit in the back with the kippah and the long ponytail? When I pull that picture, I go, is that Nathan Dolly? <laughs> I was like, what? That looks like Nathan. And then I pulled up to the woman in front here in the white. It looks like Karen. Looks like my wife, Karen Spears. I'm like, oh my gosh. I go, Karen, come in here and look at this. She goes, oh my gosh. She gets down right in front of the computer. She goes, that looks like me. That looks like Nathan. I thought it was just funny. I'm like, wow, what are the odds? 
<laughs> so ta- what is tashlik? A Jewish custom tashlik, the Hebrew word tashlik is in actually mica. It means to cast off. Okay? It's actually the word for confession. Confession in Hebrew means to cast off, to throw it away from you. Okay? You're confessing. You're getting it off you. Okay? It's based on the book of Night, Micah 7, 18 through 20 that says this. Who is a God like you, pardoning the sin and overlooking the crimes of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in grace. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. Think about that phrase. I never saw that phrase before like this time. He will subdue our iniquities. Iniquities, avon, means inherent weaknesses. Who here has inherent weaknesses that you struggle with? I, lo- I saw this phrase and I'm like, why did I never see that before? He will subdue our weaknesses. I love that. You will throw all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will show truth to Yaakov and grace to Abraham as you have sworn to our ancestors since days of long ago. So the tradition is to go to a body of water, a river, a lake, or the sea, and to cast stones or pieces of bread into the water, reflecting on and showing remorse for our iniquities, for our sins. It symbolizes our sins and God's forgiveness. When you throw them into a river, what happens? They go away, right? It's confession. It's like we confess, just as, like Scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, it's gone. So it's this kind of, we do it as a community or as individuals, right? And we go to a body of water and do tashlik on Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to do that Tuesday, this, this, this Sabbath. I'm going to go to a body of water and, and, and read Scripture, maybe do some praise, and I'm going to do tashlik. It's a custom. There's nowhere in Scripture that says I have to do it, but what a beautiful custom, right? How is it wrong to do that? And especially as a community. Do they look like they're being a good community right there? Absolutely. They're pursuing God together in a holy thing. And all of this, all these traditions, all these things, is a way to make special the time, this time of new beginnings and reconnect with God and recognize Him as our King, our groom, and our kinsman redeemer. That's what it's all about. Okay? That's what remembering is about. So in closing, I want to do this. Turn to Matthew 24. Does anybody recall other scriptures? Thessalonians, I'll let you read that again in a second. But are there other scriptures where it talks about a shofar blast or a trumpet blast? Anybody remember? Revelation does, absolutely. What's happening in the book of Revelation? Judgment's happening, right? But what else? The Messiah is returning, right? How about 1 Corinthians 15? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. Anybody remember that? Guys remember? Here, I'll go to it and read it real quick. First Corinthians. Paul is talking about some very interesting things. He's talking about the resurrection from the dead. What the body's like. It says, when the body is sown, it decays. When it's raised, it cannot decay. When sown, it is without dignity. When raised, it, is, it will be beautiful. When sown, it is weak. When raised, it will be strong. When sown, it is an ordinary human body. When raised, it will be a body controlled by the Spirit. If there is an ordinary human body, there is also a body controlled by the Spirit. And it goes on. But then in uh, 15, 51, I'll, I'll start with 50. Let me say this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot share in the kingdom of God, nor can something that decays share in what does not decay. Look, I will tell you a secret. Or 
in some verses says a mystery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us will die, but we will be changed. It will take but a moment in the blink of an eye at the final shofar. A trumpet blast, a shofar blast. At the final shofar. For the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised to live forever and we too will be changed. For this material which can decay must be clothed with imperishability. This, that, this which is mortal must be clothed with immortality. When what decays puts on imperishability and what is mortal puts on immortality, then this passage in the Tanakh will be fulfilled. Oh, so there's something yet to be fulfilled in, the, in Scripture. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and sin draws its power from the Torah. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. So, something very significant happens with a shofar blast, doesn't it? In fact, it says the last shofar blast. And then, would you mind reading? Can we get the microphone again, please? Would you mind reading from Thessalonians? First Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Oh, it sounds like he's talking about the same thing right here in 1 Corinthians, huh? So, when it's supposed to be Rosh Hashanah as a day of remembering, do you think maybe it's to recall this that we're being told here? To remember this so we don't miss it, right? Remember I've talked about the feast being a rehearsal. A rehearsal for what? For events yet to come. Significant, miraculous events. Now, Go to Matthew 24, and I'm going to end with this. Show you how significant Rosh Hashanah is. Matthew 24, verse 1. As Yeshua left the temple and he was going away, his Talmudim, his disciples, his students, came and called his attention to its buildings. But he answered them, You see all these? Yes, I tell you, they will be totally destroyed. Not a single stone will be left standing. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the Talmudim came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will, all these thi- when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that you are coming at the, and the, that the Olam Hazeh is coming, the age to come, the Messianic age? In other words, is now the time that you're going to come as the king? Are you going to reveal yourself now? Right? When's this going to happen? And you sure reply, watch out. Don't let anyone fool you. Wait, what? What are you talking about? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. You will hear the noise of wars nearby and the news of wars far off. See to it that you don't become frightened. Such things must happen, but the end is yet to come. For peoples will fight each other, nations will fight each other, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various parts of the world. All this is but the beginning of the birth pains. At that time, you will be arrested and handed over to be punished and put to to death. And all the peoples will hate you because of me. Wow. Are we seeing some of this stuff right now? Potentially are. And, you know, somebody said this in our men's group on Thursday. They go, oh, every generation thought that they were in the end times. You know what we said? This is true, except... All those generations for the last 2,000 years did not have Israel reestablished and Jerusalem reestablished and the Jewish people back in their land and talking about restoring the temple, which is the sign. It is the sign. Okay? So if any generation had a right to say, we might be there, you're looking at it because this has never happened before. And here it is now. Okay? Okay? And so saying that, as I'm reading here, it's interesting. They're saying, when are you coming? When are you going to be the king? When are you coming to take over? And all of Matthew 24 reads here. John and I have written this in our books. It reads here seven times Yeshua gives seven Hebrew idioms just as lightning flashes from the east from the west. Okay? 
the day and the hour that no man knows. And he goes on and on and gives seven idioms which point to a specific feast. Rosh Hashanah was known as, known as the feast of the day and the hour that no man knows. You know why? Because it happened at night. You had to see the sliver of the moon, right? The new moon. The sliver, not the dark of the moon. How do you see the dark of the moon with the naked eye? You don't. That's why there's a, a difference between days in counting. Because nowadays, they use the dark of the moon to count. But ancient times, what Hillel established was the sliver of the new moon. That's when you knew, oh, it's time. It's the new moon. You could never see the naked, the dark of the moon with a naked eye. It's not possible. Okay? You needed two witnesses. Okay? This is a big, there was big stuff that went on very significantly at this time. But they, they could narrow it down to two nights. Okay? It was a 48-hour period. So it was the feast of the day and the hour that no man knows. You had to be watching attentively, awake at night, to be able to catch it. If you were sleeping at night, you'd miss the feast. So you had to be awake, and you had to be on watch, going, all right, is it time? Where is it? Is it happening? Okay, very significant. So it was known as the feast of the day, of the, day and the hour that no man knows. It was also known as the feast as the feast of the lightning that flashes from the east to the west. Because once the two witnesses would get on horseback and or run and race to the temple to notify them, the slivers here, they would sound the shofar, significant. They would light the watch fire at the temple, and that watch fire would, sig would signal all the other people standing watch across the hilltops with their watch fires, and they would light their watch fires, and it looked like lightning going from the east to the west. Boom, 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 boom. Lighten up to let everyone know in Israel the feast has started. Okay? And even more, if you keep reading in Matthew 24, seven idioms. Basically, Yeshua was saying, hey, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, famine, plague, all the stuff that goes on, but that's, that's not even it yet. You want to know when I'm going to return? And it says it. Read it. It says, that's when I'm going to return. He says it right in there. He goes, but I don't know the day and the hour. Only the Father knows. But he's basically saying, you want to know when I'm coming back? Feast of trumpets, 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 feast of trumpets. He says it seven times to them. When he's returning, what's involved in it? What's going to be going on in the world? And why he's coming back. So is Rosh Hashanah significant in the biblical timeline in, in Yeshua's life? Very significant. Remember, every feast is pointing to a time in, Yesh in our Messiah's life. When he died, when he was in the grave, when he resurrected, when he brings the Holy Spirit as a, what, a seal as a betrothal, a sign of betrothal with us, that he's going to return. And when does he return? Rosh Hashanah, to the sound of the shofar, he returns to bring judgment. That's why it's considered the judgment day. Think about this, how it all correlates. He comes on a white horse, not as a suffering servant, but as the king of kings, as a warrior. You know what's interesting? I noted this. So Yeshua comes as a suffering servant. Peaceful, meek, did he bring peace? Did he bring peace when he was here? No, what did he say? I didn't come to bring peace. He says when he was here in the Gospels, I came to bring a sword. I will divide. I, the, the, the members of your own household, I'll divide. There will be uh, the enemies, your, your members of your own household will be your, your enemies. He goes, father against son, mother against daughter. They'll, you'll hate each other because of me. I'm at, when I'm coming as a suffering servant, meek and mild, I'm actually bringing division and warfare. But when I come as the conquering king, when everybody's going to rise up to make war, I'm bringing peace. I'm going to wipe it out. And it's going to be very peaceful. For a thousand years, it's going to be peaceful. It's going to be a thousand year Sabbath. A Sabbath for a thousand years. Imagine that. And he's going to be here on the earth with his bride, 
What happens in the ancient Hebrew patrol the process? Do you remember? They do the patrol the process. They come to the house, the wine, the breaking bread, all that that goes on, the writing of the ketubah. Remember all that? And then the groom goes away to prepare a place for his, right? His bride. The groom goes away, builds an addition on the father's house. But he eventually returns, right? When he returns, he comes with what? His groomsmen. And he lets rumors out. He's coming about the week or so before, right? But when they come, they come at night. Remember the bride has to have her lamp lit in her window with the bridesmaids to signify, hey, I, I still want to get married, right? And the groom comes with the groomsmen to what? Make it a ruckus in the middle of the night, blowing the shofars, yelling, the groom is here. See the correlation? Do you see the correlation? The feasts are highly significant. This is when our groom returns for us to bring judgment to all that's evil in the earth. I want to rehearse that. I don't want to be asleep in the middle of the night without my lamp lit in the window. I want to be awake and ready. So if I have to show up on an evening and do some traditions and have joy with my family, so be it. That's an easy thing. It really is. It's interesting is uh, they say this, on Rosh Hashanah we're called to remember God is our king. The Hebraic understanding is that when Adam and Eve sinned, when they fell, they did so because they thought themselves to be master. They failed to recognize God as king. They confused the subjectivity of evil and deception with the objectivity of right and truth. They rejected God's commands and his leadership. Maimonides, an ancient Jewish rabbi, says concerning Yom Teruah, Awake you sleepers from your sleep and ponder over your deeds. Remember your creator and go back to him in repentance. Be not those, of, those who miss realities in their pursuit of shadows and waste their years in seeking after vain things which cannot profit or deliver. Look well to your souls and consider your acts. Forsake each of you his wrong ways and improper thoughts and return to God so that he may have mercy upon you. I was just remembering when I was in Israel on the one time and was fortunate enough to be there as they were preparing and everyone went up on the roof to blow the shofars and it was like the solemnness going up there and everybody's just looking and waiting and then all of a sudden you could see that sliver and the shofar is blowing but not just on the roof where we were but you could hear it all over for miles all the different shofars and afterwards the whole atmosphere was just like electrified and everyone was dancing and singing and i can just imagine when the lord returns that that's exactly how it's going to be it's exactly how it's going to be i just hope they have the right evening <laughs> and i don't mean that in a derogatory way i mean it kind of fun but at the same time at least they're doing it i hope that they continue to do it and they, they recognize all the principle behind it and all. I, and it says in Scripture, they're going to recognize their Messiah when he comes and they're going to mourn because they're going to go, he was our Messiah and we killed him. But then it says God forgives them and he draws them unto himself. So who here is ready to celebrate Rosh Hashanah? Thank you. So please, Monday night, Starting at 6.30, I'd love to see you here. I'd love to celebrate together. We're going to start with Oneg with a big festive meal like we always do. Okay? It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to have a, a, a service, uh, lots of singing. I'm sure lots of dancing, right? Lots of dancing. And uh, we finish the service with a whole set, of like 120 blasts on the shofar. Uh, it'll be Daniel Shaw and myself will be doing it. And uh, it's going to be awesome. Okay, so I'd love to see you there. 
And uh, any last questions, comments, anything? Got it all down, right? Good, good, good. I know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, God, how can I wrap this? And all I keep getting is, hey, show up. Let's see what God does. Amen? Let's pray. Avina Shabbat Shemayim, you are our God and you are our King. And we recognize you as Creator and Lord. Father, we are so grateful for the sacrifice of Yeshua, of our Messiah for us, to draw us once more back unto you. So we are not under condemnation and not under the, the, uh, the cloud and shadow of death. Lord, we, we just love who you are. And, and we do remember. And Father, we ask that you would help us to remember even more just how much you love us. All the great and miraculous things that you have done for us. All that you will continue to do for us. Even the miracles that you're going to perform uh, later in our lives. But Father, help us to remember personally. In fact, Lord, this would be a great time in preparation for Rosh Hashanah. For us to maybe get a journal or to write down. Father, to recall, to ask you to help us to remember and to actually write down as a testimony all the miraculous things, the way you've intervened in our life to uh, show mercy to us, to save us, to protect us, to draw us close to you, to show your love for us, Father, and to make it personal. And Father, um, we just love you. We thank you so much. We ask that all that we've learned here today, if there's anything that is not from you, that you would bring correction to us. But Father, I pray that all that we study in your word, I pray that it would go deep into our soul and not just be something in our head to be intellectual, but Father, it would transform our lives, that we would carry it into our lives and show your light to others every day of the week. So Father, we bless you, we honor you, and we thank you. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Please rise.